1A. The Incredible Dolphin Many people say dolphins are very intelligent. They seem to be able to think, understand, and learn things quickly. But are they smart like humans, or more like cats or dogs? Dolphins use their brains differently from people. But scientists say dolphin intelligence and human intelligence are alike in some ways. How? Fact 1. Talk to me. Like humans, every dolphin has its own name. The name is a special whistle. Each dolphin chooses a specific whistle for itself, usually by its first birthday. Actually, scientists think dolphins, like people, talk to each other about a lot of things, such as their age, their feelings, or finding food. And like humans, dolphins use a system of sounds and body language to communicate. But understanding their conversations is not easy for humans. No one speaks dolphin yet, but some scientists are trying to learn. Fact 2. Let's play. Dolphins are also social animals. They live in groups called pods, and they often join others from different pods to play games and have fun, just like people. In fact, playing together is something only intelligent animals do. Fact 3. Fishermen's Helpers Dolphins and humans are similar in another way. Both make plans to get something they want. In the seas of southern Brazil, for example, dolphins use an interesting strategy to get food. When fish are near a boat, dolphins signal to the fishermen to put their nets in the water. Using this method, the men can catch a lot of fish. What is the advantage for the dolphins? Why do they assist the men? The dolphins get to eat some of the fish. One B, musical elephants. In the town of Lampang in northern Thailand, there is an unusual group of musicians. They play many different kinds of music, everything from traditional Thai songs to music by Beethoven. Both children and adults love this group. What makes them so popular? Is it their music, their looks? Yes, it's both of these things, but it's also something else. They're elephants. These musical elephants started at the Thai Elephant Conservation Center, TECC, in Lampang. The TECC protects elephants. It teaches people to understand and care for these huge but gentle animals. And like many zoos around the world, the TECC encourages elephants to paint. Richard Lair works with the TECC. He knows a lot about elephants. He says some of the animals' paintings are very good. But in fact, elephants hear better than they see. And so he had an idea. If elephants are intelligent and they have good hearing, maybe they can play music. To test his idea, Lair and a friend started the Thai Elephant Orchestra. During a performance, the elephants play a variety of instruments, including the drums and the xylophone. The animals also use their voices and trunks to make sounds. But can elephants really make music properly? Yes, says Lair. They're very creative. Humans encourage the animals to play, but the elephants make their own songs. They don't just copy their trainers or other people. There are now CDs of the group's music, which earn money for the TECC. And the music these artists create is pretty amazing. Two A, travel adventure, Alaska to Argentina. Many people dream of going on a great travel adventure. Most of us keep dreaming. Others make it happen. Greg Bleakney's dream was to travel the Americas from top to bottom. He got the idea after he finished a 1,600-kilometer, 1,000-mile bike ride. Greg's friend Brooks Allen was also a cyclist. The two friends talked and slowly formed a plan. They would travel from Alaska to Argentina by bike. To pay for the trip, Greg and Brooks worked and saved their money for years. Once they were on the road, they often camped outdoors or stayed in hostels. In many places, local people opened their homes to the two friends and gave them food. During their trip, Greg and Brooks cycled through deserts, rainforests, and mountains. They visited modern cities and ancient ruins, such as Machu Picchu in Peru 
and everywhere they went, they met other cyclists from all over the world. In May 2007, two years, 12 countries, and over 30,500 kilometers, 19,000 miles later, Greg eventually reached Ushuaia, Argentina, the southernmost city in the world. Near Guatemala, Brooks had to return to the U.S., and Greg continued without him. The trip taught both men a lot about traveling, especially if you travel abroad. What did they learn? Here is some of Greg's advice. Travel light. The less baggage you have, the less you'll worry about. Be flexible. Don't plan everything. Then you'll be more relaxed and happy, especially if there are problems. Be polite. As one traveler told Greg, always remember that nobody wants to fight, cheat, or rob a nice guy. To be extreme destination Vanuatu. Vanuatu is an island nation in the South Pacific. It is also one of the smallest countries in the world. But for those interested in adventure and sport, there is a lot to do. Some of the best snorkeling and sea kayaking can be found here. Vanuatu's islands also offer visitors two of the most exciting and dangerous activities in the world volcano surfing and land diving. Volcano surfing. On Tana Island, Mount Yasur rises 300 meters, 1,000 feet, into the sky. Yasur is an active volcano and it erupts almost every day, sometimes several times a day. For centuries, both island locals and visitors have climbed this mountain to visit the top. Recently, people have also started climbing Yasur to surf the volcano. In some ways, volcano surfing is like surfing in the sea, but in other ways, it's very different. A volcano surfer's goal is to escape the erupting volcano without getting hit by flying rocks. It's fast, fun, and dangerous, the perfect extreme sport. Land diving. Most people are familiar with bungee jumping. But did you know bungee jumping started on Pentecost Island in Vanuatu and is almost 15 centuries old? The original activity called land diving is part of a religious ceremony. A man ties tree vines to his legs. He then jumps head first from a high tower. The goal? To touch the earth with the top of his head without breaking the vine and hitting the ground hard. Every spring, island natives, men only, still perform this amazing test of strength. Three A, Hip Hop Planet. Hip hop started in New York City in the 1970s. Today, many countries have their own local hip hop scenes. Artists from different backgrounds rap about everything from cars and designer clothes to social issues. Here are two examples. Dakar, Senegal. Asan Ndai, 19, loves hip-hop music. He grew up in a small fishing village in Senegal. For a time, he was popular as a DJ in clubs in Dakar, the capital city of Senegal. Today, Asan lives in his village again. He has formed a rap group with other family members. They rap about their lives as village fishermen and about working long, hard days and earning almost no money. Many people in their audience can understand these things. Rap, Asan says, doesn't belong to American culture. It belongs here. It has always existed here because of our pain and our hardships. Asan dreams of making a CD and having a better life. Despite his hardships, the music gives Asan hope. The Czech Republic Europe is home to 8 to 12 million Roma, a group of people often called gypsies. Many Roma are poor. In some places, they also face discrimination. Now, some Roma teenagers are using hip-hop to teach tolerance. In the Czech Republic, Roma teens meet for a hip-hop class called Rap for Peace Hip-Hop. Their instructor is Shamima Williams. She is a member of the all-female rap group Godessa from South Africa. In the lessons, the teens learn to write rap music and use it to teach others about Roma culture. 
These teens, Shamima believes, can use the music to change their lives and other people's attitudes. Use your creative energy and see what the possibilities are, she says. Three B, Brazilian Samba. Samba is one of Brazil's most popular music and dance styles. In many ways, it is a symbol of the country itself. In the words of one of modern samba's main artists, Shu Georgi, "Samba is our truth, our peculiarity, and our flag." When people today hear the word samba, they often think of the festival of Carnival, and the city of Rio de Janeiro. But there are many different types of samba, and these styles differ throughout Brazil. Samba reggae. Today, one of the most popular types of samba comes from Bahia, a state in the eastern part of the country. It's called samba reggae. From the 16th to 18th centuries, over three million Africans were brought to Brazil to work as slaves. Today, in Bahia, 80% of the population is black. Samba from this region of Brazil is heavily influenced by African rhythms. Modern samba reggae is a mix of Rio samba, African drum beats, and Jamaican reggae. It's a bit slower than Rio samba and is usually performed in large groups, sometimes with over 200 drums playing at one time. Bahia's most famous drumming group is Oladum. Many say the group invented the samba reggae sound. But Ola Doom is not only a musical group; its members have also created local organizations to help young people and the poor. Every year in the city of Salvador in Bahia, the lively sounds of samba reggae fill the streets during Carnival, one of the world's greatest parties. Four A. Life beyond Earth? Is there intelligent life on other planets? For years, scientists said no, or we don't know. But today, this is changing. Seth Shostak and Alexandra Barnett are astronomers. They believe intelligent life exists somewhere in the universe. They also think we will soon contact these beings. Why do Shostak and Barnett think intelligent life exists on other planets? The first reason is time. Scientists believe the universe is about 12 billion years old. This is too long, say Shostak and Barnett, for only one planet in the entire universe to have intelligent life. The second reason is size. The universe is huge. Tools like the Hubble telescope have shown that there are at least 100 billion galaxies, says Shostak, and our galaxy, the Milky Way, has at least 100 billion stars. Some planets circling these stars might be similar to Earth. Looking for intelligent life. Until recently, it was difficult to search for signs of intelligent life in the universe. But now, powerful telescopes allow scientists to identify smaller planets, the size of Mars or Earth, in other solar systems. These planets might have intelligent life. Making contact. Have beings from space already visited Earth? Probably not, says Shostak. The distance between planets is too great. Despite this, intelligent beings might eventually contact us using other methods, such as radio signals. In fact, they may be trying to communicate with us now, but we don't have the right tools to receive their messages. But this is changing, says Shostak. By 2025, we could make contact with other life forms in our universe. Four B, colonies in space. Stephen Hawking, one of the world's most important scientists, believes that to survive, humans must move into space. Once we spread out into space and establish independent colonies, our future should be safe, he says. Today, the United States, India, China, and Japan are all planning to send astronauts back to Earth's closest neighbor, the Moon. Each country wants to create space stations there between 2020 and 2030. These stations will prepare humans to visit and later live on Mars or other Earth-like planets. 
Robert Zubrin, a rocket scientist, thinks humans should colonize space. He wants to start with Mars. Why? There are several advantages. For one, sending people to the Moon and Mars will allow us to learn a lot. For example, whether living on other planets is possible. Then we can eventually create new human societies on other planets. In addition, the advances we make for space travel in the fields of science, technology, medicine, and health can also benefit us here on Earth. But not everyone thinks sending humans into space is a smart idea. Many say it's too expensive to send people, even on a short journey. And most space trips are not short. A one-way trip to Mars, for example, would take about six months. People traveling this kind of distance face a number of health problems. Also, for many early space settlers, life would be extremely difficult. On the moon's surface, for example, the air and the sun's rays are very dangerous. People would have to stay indoors most of the time. Despite these concerns, sending people into space seems certain. In the future, we might see lunar cities and maybe even new human cultures on other planets. First stop, the moon. Five A, city challenges. Worldwide, cities gain a million people a week. This kind of growth brings problems, and today many of the world's largest cities face similar challenges: high housing costs, pollution, and crime, to name a few. What are some urban planners doing to fix these problems and improve people's lives? Hyderabad, India, population more than five million. To improve residents' lives. Hyderabad is planting trees and parks. The city is even creating greener buildings that use less water and less electricity for power. Adding green to a city has a number of advantages. For example, trees remove pollution from the air and make it cleaner. In Hyderabad, streets were gray and ugly a few years ago. Today, they are filled with trees and flowers, making the city cleaner and more colorful. Green areas also give people places to relax or exercise and walk. A study in the U.S. showed something else interesting: the greener a neighborhood is, the less crime there is against people and property, especially buildings and cars. Sao Paulo, Brazil, population more than 18 million. Many people work in the center of Sao Paulo, but they don't live there. They've spread out to neighborhoods outside the city where housing is cheaper. Every day, these people travel into the city, and traffic is very heavy. Urban planners are using different strategies to address this issue. First, they are building better subways. Another goal is to make it cheaper for people to live in the downtown area. Doing this will shorten the distance people travel for work and reduce traffic and pollution in the city. Five B, Dubai then and now. Dubai is like no other place on earth. It is the world capital of living large, a city of big business, luxury hotels, skyscrapers, and huge shopping malls. In the early 20th century, Dubai was a successful trading port. People from all over the world stopped in Dubai to do business, but it was still a small city, and most people lived as fishermen, merchants, or by raising animals. Then, in 1966, oil was discovered. In time, this brought a lot of money into the region, and soon Dubai began to change. Today, Dubai is one of the world's most influential business centers. In fact, each year, most of the city's annual earnings come from business, not oil. The city is also a global trading port. Recently, Dubai has become a popular spot for tourists. People from abroad come to relax on its beaches, and every year millions visit just to go shopping. Dubai is also one of the world's fastest-growing cities. Construction is everywhere. Buildings, some of the tallest on Earth, are built in months. The city also has a number of man-made islands. One of these, the Palm Jumeirah, is shaped like a palm tree and is particularly beautiful. 
The city is still an amazing mix of people from different backgrounds. Individuals from 150 countries live and work in Dubai, and foreigners now outnumber Dubai natives 8 to 1. Many people welcome the city's growth, but an increasing number of Dubai natives have concerns about the speed of change. As Mohammed Al-Abar, a Dubai businessman, says, We must always remember where we came from. Our kids must know we worked very, very hard to get where we are now, and there's a lot more work to do. Six A, more than a shoe. Stylistic, futuristic, different. These are some of the words used to describe Manolo Blahnik's and Dave Graziosi's shoes. What makes their shoes so special? The shoe designer, born to a Spanish mother and a Czech father, Manolo Blahnik grew up in the Canary Islands near North Africa. In his twenties, he moved to New York City and began to design shoes for women. Today, his high heels, often called Manolos, are known around the world. Women love my shoes, says Blahnik. Some never take them off. Why are his shoes so popular? Yes, they're beautiful. On the other hand, his high heels aren't always particularly comfortable. They're also costly. Prices range from hundreds to thousands of dollars. Maybe the best answer is this. Each pair of Manolos is a work of art like a painting by Picasso. But aren't they just shoes? Yes, only shoes, says Blahnik. But if they bring a bit of happiness to someone, then perhaps they are something more than shoes. The Shoe Engineer At $30,000 a pair, moon boots aren't cheap. But to walk in space, you need high-tech shoes, like those designed by Dave Graziosi. He and his team are making space boots for NASA. We're planning for the moon and beyond, he says. The latest space boot is the M2 Trekker. These boots are smaller and weigh less than the ones Neil Armstrong wore to the moon. In them, astronauts can walk comfortably on the moon's rocky surface. M2 Trekkers also protect astronauts' feet from extreme cold and heat. They can be worn in temperatures ranging from minus 212 degrees Celsius, minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit to 177 degrees Celsius, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. They are truly more than just a shoe. 6B. The Miracle of Silk Silk. The word itself is beautiful. The story of silk starts in China over 4,000 years ago. One legend says a silkworm's cocoon fell into a woman's teacup. It then opened into a single, unbroken thread. This was an important discovery. The Chinese learned they could use the cocoons to make cloth that was both beautiful to look at and soft to touch. Making silk was a protected secret in China for many years. In other countries, silk was very rare and valuable. Often it was worth more than gold. Legend tells us that the secret finally got out when a princess left China to go to India. In her hair, she secretly carried many silkworms. By the year 1 AD, silk was sold as far west as Rome and all along the Silk Road, which connected China with places in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Eventually, around the year 300, silk also traveled from China to Japan. Centuries later, in 1522, the Spanish brought silkworms to Mexico. Nowadays, people around the world still make many beautiful things from silk. But silk isn't only beautiful. It looks delicate, but it's actually very strong. For example, it has been used to make bicycle tires, and some doctors even use silk threads in hospital operations. Silk is also lightweight and warm. This makes it great for clothes like winter jackets, pants, and boots. All of this from a little insect, the silkworm. That is the miracle of silk. 7a. Dinosaurs, Fact and Fiction. 
You learned about dinosaurs in school. Maybe you have seen them in a museum. But how much do you really know about these animals? Were dinosaurs just big reptiles? For years, scientists thought dinosaurs were big, dumb, and cold-blooded. In other words, just giant reptiles. Some dinosaurs were huge, but many were about the size of modern-day birds or dogs. Were dinosaurs warm or cold-blooded? Paleontologists are not sure, but they believe some were intelligent. Of course, no dinosaur was as smart as a human or even a monkey. However, some smaller dinosaurs, like the 2-meter, 6-foot Trudon, had fairly large brains. Was Tyrannosaurus rex a powerful predator? Some scientists think the opposite is true. In the movies, T-Rex is often a speedy giant. But in fact, this dinosaur could not run very fast. Physically, it was too large. In reality, T-Rex probably moved as fast as an elephant. Also, T-Rex had very small arms. Without strong legs or arms, this dinosaur probably wasn't a powerful hunter. It may have been a scavenger instead, only eating animals that were already dead. Did an asteroid kill the dinosaurs? An asteroid hit Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago. It created a 180-kilometer, 110-mile wide crater called Chicxulub. Many believe this asteroid caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. But even before this, dinosaurs were already dying out around the world for many reasons. At the end of the Cretaceous period, for example, the global climate was changing. The Earth's temperature was getting colder. Are all dinosaurs now extinct? Dinosaurs completely disappeared about 65 million years ago. However, scientists believe modern-day birds are descendants of certain dinosaurs. If this is true, then dinosaurs' relatives are still walking and flying among us. Seven B. Mystery of the Terrible Hand. Name: Dinochirus. Lived when? Seventy million years ago. Discovered where? Mongolia. Whose arms are these? Paleontologists have sought an answer to this question for almost forty years. In the 1960s, paleontologists unearthed a pair of giant arms in Mongolia. The length of each, when fully extended, was 2.4 meters, 8 feet. The claws were 26 centimeters, 10 inches long. Paleontologists called the animal Dinochirus, meaning terrible hand. So, what did this animal look like? Paleontologists aren't sure. Many times, scientists have examined the area where they found the arms. But since the original discovery, they have unearthed only a few other bones of this dinosaur. Despite this, scientists have some ideas about Dinochirus's appearance. Physically, this animal's arms and hands are similar to ornithomimids, a type of dinosaur that looked like a modern-day ostrich and used its arms for catching food. But when paleontologists use the size of Dinochirus's arms to try to estimate the size of its body, it seems to have been a huge animal, almost 12 meters, 40 feet long. This is almost as big as a T-Rex. Other scientists have a different opinion. They think Dinochirus was a smaller dinosaur with extremely long arms. But why would a little animal need limbs so long? To climb trees or to hunt for food, perhaps? The body is a mystery, says Thomas Holtz, a paleontologist at the University of Maryland in the U.S. It might not be an ornithomimid at all. But then what is it? Until paleontologists find new fossil evidence, this question remains unanswered. 8A. The Brothers Grimm. Long before J.K. Rowling, there were Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, two young men from Germany who loved a good story. The Grimm brothers never expected to be storytellers for children, but today their fairy tales are read and loved in over 160 languages. Once Upon a Time 
Jakob and Wilhelm were introduced to folk tales, traditional stories people memorized and told again and again as university students. The brothers loved these stories of adventure and magic. Soon, they began to collect traditional folk tales from storytellers in Germany. Many of these tales were similar to stories told in France, Italy, Japan, and other countries. Between 1812 and 1814, the Grimm brothers published two books. These included stories like Hansel and Gretel and Little Red Riding Hood. Grimm's tales reflected traditional life and beliefs in Germany. For example, forests are common in Germany, and this image appears often in the Grimm stories. For medieval Germans, the forest was a dangerous place. In Grimm's fairy tales, witches, talking animals, and other magical beings live in the forest. People's lives change forever when they visit this place. Children's Stories Although Grimm's fairy tales are now considered children's stories, the brothers first wrote them primarily for adults. Many of the early tales were dark and a little scary. Later, the brothers changed the text of some of the original stories. They softened many of the tales and also added drawings. This made them more appropriate for children. Like the early tales, though, each of today's stories still has a moral. Work hard, be good, and listen to your parents. Eight B, the tale of the seven ravens. Once upon a time, there lived a man and a woman who had seven sons. The couple wanted a daughter very much, and finally they had a girl. She was very pretty, and her parents loved her very much. One day, the father needed water for the child, so he sent the seven brothers to a well in the forest to get it. Once there, though, the boys began to fight, and the water jug fell into the well. The youths looked into the well and thought of their father. They were afraid to go home. Hours passed. Where are those boys? shouted the father angrily. They are probably playing a game and have forgotten about the water. I wish they were all turned into ravens. And when he looked up, he saw seven black birds flying away. The father was shocked. What have I done? he thought. But it was too late. He could not take back his words. In time, the girl grew up and discovered she had brothers. The story of their misfortune affected her deeply, and she decided to find them. For years, she searched and did not stop. She was determined to find her brothers. Finally, she found their home. To enter, she needed a special key made from a chicken bone, which she did not have. The girl thought for a moment and then took a knife and cut off one of her fingers. With it, she opened the front door and went inside. On a table, there were seven plates and seven cups. She ate and drank a little from each. In the last cup, she accidentally dropped a ring that her parents had given her. Eventually, the ravens returned for their meal. The girl hid behind the door and watched. When the seventh raven drank from his cup, something hit his mouth. The raven recognized it immediately. It was his parents' ring. I wish our sister were here, he said, and then we could be free. At that moment, their sister ran to them, and suddenly the ravens were human again. The brothers kissed their sister, and all eight of them went home together happily. 9A. Tornado Chasers in the U.S., tornadoes are responsible for 80 deaths and more than 1,500 injuries each year. Although they occur quite frequently, tornadoes are difficult to predict. Why? Tornadoes develop from storms. But only some storms have the potential to become tornadoes. Meteorologists don't know where and when a storm will touch the ground and turn into a tornado. Today, the warning time for a tornado is usually just 13 minutes. Tim Samaras is a storm chaser. His job is to find tornadoes and follow them. When he gets close to a tornado, he puts a special tool called a turtle probe on the ground. This tool measures things like a twister's temperature, humidity, and wind speed. With this information, Samaras can learn what causes tornadoes to develop. If meteorologists understand this, they can warn people about twisters sooner and save lives. 
How does Samaris hunt tornadoes? It's not easy. First, he has to find one. Tornadoes are too small to see using weather satellites, so Samaris can't rely on these tools to find a twister. Instead, he waits for tornadoes to develop. Every May and June, Samaris drives about 40,000 kilometers, 25,000 miles, across an area known as Tornado Alley, looking and hoping to spot a twister. Once Samaris sees a tornado, the chase begins. But a tornado is hard to follow. Some tornadoes change direction several times. For example, moving east and then west and then east again. When Samaris finally gets near a tornado, he puts the turtle probe on the ground. Being this close to a twister is terrifying. Debris is flying in the air. The wind is blowing at high speed. He must get away quickly. The work is risky, even for a skilled chaser like Samaris. But danger won't stop his hunt for the perfect storm. Nine B, smoke jumpers. Every year, wildfires destroy millions of hectares of forest land. Homes are damaged and thousands of people die. Smoke jumpers are helping to stop this. What is a smoke jumper? Smoke jumpers are a special type of firefighter. They jump from planes into areas that are difficult to reach by car or on foot, like the middle of a mountain forest. They race to put out fires as fast as they can. What do smoke jumpers do? At a fire site, smoke jumpers first examine the land and decide how to fight the fire. Their main goal is to stop a fire from spreading. Using basic equipment such as shovels and axes, smoke jumpers clear land of burnable material like plants and other dry material. They carry water with them too, but only a limited amount. Who can be a smoke jumper? Although the majority of smoke jumpers are men, more women are joining. Most important are your height and weight. Smoke jumpers employed in the U.S., for example, must be 120 to 200 pounds, 54 to 91 kilograms, so they don't get hurt when they land or get blown by strong winds. Smoke jumpers must also be capable of surviving in the wilderness. In Russia, many smoke jumpers know how to find food in the forest and even make simple furniture from trees. The work is dangerous and the hours are long, but for these firefighters, smoke jumping isn't just an occupation. They love being able to jump out of planes, fight fires, and live in the forest. As 28-year-old Russian smoke jumper Alexei Tishin says, this is the best job for tough guys. 10A. Mexico's Pyramid of the Moon. A mysterious city. Teotihuacan was once one of the world's most important cities, but many things about it are still unknown today. How did the people live, and why did they abandon their city? For years, answers to some of these questions have been buried in the Pyramid of the Moon. Now, findings in this ancient structure are helping archaeologists learn more about Teotihuacan's people and their culture. Clues in the Pyramid Until recently, many experts thought Teotihuacan was a peaceful society, mostly ruled by gentle and wise leaders. But recent findings in the Pyramid of the Moon indicate something else. Archaeologists discovered a number of headless bodies. Most were foreigners. Many had their hands tied and were buried alive, along with animals, weapons, and other objects of power. Apparently, the people and objects found inside the pyramid were offerings to the gods. However, the findings in the pyramid are difficult to interpret. These findings are like sentences, says archaeologist Leonardo Lopez Lujan, but we don't have all the words, so they're hard to read. Despite these problems, several archaeologists have concluded this. Teotihuacan was not a society governed by peaceful rulers. In reality, officials used human sacrifice, says archaeologist Saburo Sugiyama, to control the people. The city probably also had a powerful army. The search goes on. Who were the city's leaders? Scientists don't know. They have not found a king buried in the pyramid or any statues of Teotihuacan's rulers. But archaeologists continue to search for them. 
they hope to learn more about the pyramid's creators and one of the world's most powerful ancient cities. Ten B. Who built Giza's pyramids? For centuries, the pyramids of Giza have been timeless symbols of Egyptian culture. But who actually built them? For years, we did not know for sure. But archaeologists recently discovered an ancient village near the pyramids. Close by, there was also a cemetery where pyramid builders were buried. From studying these places, archaeologists can now confirm that the pyramids were not built by slaves or foreigners or space aliens. Ordinary Egyptians built them. It took about 80 years to build the pyramids. According to archaeologists, about 20,000 to 30,000 people were involved in completing the task. The workers had different roles. Some dug up the rock, some moved it, and some shaped it into blocks. People also worked on different teams, each with its own name. On a wall in Khufu's Great Pyramid, for example, a group of workers wrote, Friends of Khufu. Teams often competed to do a job faster. Life for these workers was hard. We can see that in their skeletons, says Aza Mohammed Seri Aldin, a scientist studying bodies found in the cemetery. The bones show signs of arthritis, which developed from carrying heavy things for a long time. Archaeologists have also found many female skeletons in the village and cemetery. The damage to their bones is similar to the men's. Their lives may have been even tougher. Male workers lived to age 40 to 45, but women to only 30 to 35. However, workers usually had enough food, and they also had medical care if they got sick or hurt. The work was challenging, but laborers were proud of their work. It's because they were not just building the tomb of their king, says Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass. They were building Egypt. It was a national project, and everyone was a participant. 11a. Pirates, Romance and Reality In many movies, a pirate's life is an exciting adventure. But what was life actually like for an 18th century pirate? And which parts of the movie pirate are real and which are invented? A pirate's life. In reality, the average pirate was usually trying to escape from a difficult life. Some were ex-sailors who were treated poorly on their ships. Others were escaped slaves who wanted their freedom. They came from many different backgrounds. But on a pirate ship, equality was important. Men elected their captain and created the ship's rules together. The men also divided the income from stolen goods, and they shared these earnings fairly. Pirate Treasure In popular culture, pirates are often shown with chests full of gold. It is true they took money from others. However, it was far more common for pirates to steal things like cloth, spices, and even medicine. Then they often sold these things. Of course, purchasing stolen goods from pirates was illegal, but many people did it. Also, unlike movie pirates, real pirates didn't bury their money, says Cory Convertito, who works at a maritime museum in the U.S. They blew it as soon as they could on women and booze. Pirate Style Movie pirates often wear eye patches and have wooden legs. In reality, many pirates did look like this. Why? One factor was the poor living conditions. Life at sea was hard and dangerous, says David Moore, a maritime museum employee in the U.S. Disease was also common. For these reasons, some pirates lost eyes and legs. But many pirates did one thing for their health. They wore earrings, just as in the movies. They believed putting weight on the ears stopped seasickness. 11b. Women of the Waves Throughout history, the majority of pirates have been men. But were there any women pirates? Absolutely. Below are two from different parts of the world. Mary Reed, Pirate in Disguise. 
Mary Reed was born in England around 1690. She lived most of her life disguised as a man. As a teenager looking for adventure, she dressed as a boy and got a job at sea. Later, as a young woman, still pretending to be a man, she got work on a ship and sailed to the Caribbean. On one journey, pirates attacked Mary's ship. Instead of fighting, she joined them. But Mary had to be careful because many pirate ships had a rule. No women allowed. If the men discovered her true identity, they might shoot and kill her. So at first, Mary stayed by herself and avoided the others. But one day, she made a surprising discovery. One of the pirates on the ship was actually a woman. Anne Bonny was the captain's girlfriend, but she was also a pirate herself. Mary told Anne her secret, and the two women became good friends and powerful fighters. They fought together until they were captured in 1720. Ching Shi Pirate Queen. In the early 1800s, pirate Ching Shi terrorized the Chinese coast. When her powerful pirate husband died, control of his 500 junks transferred to Ching Shi. While she was boss, her fleet grew to almost 2,000 ships. A fearless fighter, Ching Shi led nearly 80,000 pirates, both men and women. They targeted ships and towns along the coast of China. For years, leaders throughout the region failed to stop her. Eventually, Ching Shi retired, a rich and respected woman. Twelve A, mystery on Everest. Were Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay really the first people to reach the top of Mount Everest? Some believe British climbers George Mallory and Andrew Irvine reached the summit previously in June 1924. Unfortunately, this is hard to prove because both men vanished on the mountain. Recently, a team of climbers visited Everest hoping to solve this mystery. Near Everest's first step, on the way to the summit, the team found Mallory's oxygen tank, evidence that he and Irvine were near the top. Close by, a member of the team, Conrad Anker, discovered Mallory's body. When the team examined Mallory's body, they found items like a knife and matches, but no photos. Why is this significant? Mallory carried a photo of his wife with him. He planned to leave it at the top of Everest if he reached the summit. Did Mallory and Irvine achieve their goal and reach the top? Probably not, says Anchor. Here's why. Difficult path, poor equipment. Mallory and Irvine were last seen near Everest's second step. This is a 27-meter, 90-foot wall of rock. Climbing this section of Everest is extremely difficult, even with modern climbing equipment. Without the right tools, it is doubtful Mallory and Irvine were able to proceed to the top. No frostbite. Mallory and Irvine were near the summit late in the day. Climbers who reach the summit at this time need to camp at the top. If you do this, it is common to suffer from frostbite. But Mallory's body had no sign of frostbite. So what happened to Mallory and Irvine? Anchor thinks they probably turned back just after the first step. When Mallory was going down, perhaps he accidentally fell. Irvine's body has never been found. Whatever happened, they will always be remembered as early Everest heroes. 12B. The Missing Pilot. A Dangerous Journey. On July 2, 1937, Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan left New Guinea for Howland Island in the Pacific. This was the longest and most dangerous part of their trip around the world. Earhart had trouble shortly after takeoff. The weather was stormy, so she had to fly at 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. Going this high, the plane used gas quickly. After about 20 hours, Earhart and Noonan approached Howland Island. The island was only about 105 kilometers, 65 miles, away. But the bright sun was shining in their faces, so they couldn't see it. Near Howland, a ship, the Itasca, was waiting. Earhart contacted the ship. Gas is low, she said. The Itasca tried to maintain contact with her, but got no response. Finally, the Itasca called for help. 
People searched for Earhart and Noonan for days. Despite the searchers' efforts, they found nothing. Missing. What happened to Amelia Earhart? No one knows for sure. During the flight, she probably headed in the wrong direction because the sun was bright and it was hard to see. So she got lost. Soon after, her plane ran out of gas and she died at sea. Another idea is that she survived the plane crash, swam to an uninhabited island, and later died there. Still others think she survived the crash and secretly returned to the U.S. with a new identity. Although the first theory seems most likely, none of these ideas has been proven. Today, people are still investigating Earhart's and Noonan's disappearance. Noonan's body has also never been found. Whatever happened, Amelia probably died as she wished. When I go, she said, I'd like best to go in my plane.